Okay, oh, yeah, cool. So I'm, uh, I guess 12 minutes I have left. Um, so this is a research update for me on uh, the general theory behind the StormX hybrid uh, control block. And I've been working on part of the process with the, uh, the paper last Charlotte and then continuing work. Uh, so as an overview, I'll go over some goals and motivation for the work. Uh, cover the previous work the lab's done in the area, specifically reachable set theory. Um, show again the same optimal hybrid formulation that it showed in Charlotte. It hasn't really changed that much, but as a kind of reminder of what I'm working with, uh, go over reachable set theory for impulsive maneuvering and how that turns into closed form solutions for propulsive control, uh, differential drag control, and then current and future work. So as, as we've as seen many times now, um, SwarmX mission is going to be a novel demonstration of three, three CubeSats in flight uh, with a science mission that dictates over a thousand kilometers in a long track separation. And given the limited fuel payload budget on each spacecraft, it's not really feasible um, to do the mission without the use of differential drag, which is essentially a zero delta V cost maneuver. Um, in addition to this, uh, desire for this type of control on the mission. Uh, reconfiguration windows can range from 15 to up to 450 orbits, given the low instantaneous impulse that differential drag applies on the spacecraft swarms. We can have these really short control windows, really long control windows, and so we have to be able to fit both constraints. So it really raises, at least at this point, two big theoretical questions. One, can differential drag be blended optimally with pulsive control in closed form? Uh, spoiler, yeah, that was uh, what I presented in Charlotte. Uh, the second question, can close from impulsive control be applied to large reconfigurations uh, with these extremely long extended control windows while still maintaining provable optimality? So that's what I've been kind of working on for the last few months. As far as previous work the lab's done, it's really kind of a continuing story with reachable set theory that starts with Adam, who came up with a numerical approach for reachable set theory, uh, um, using it to come up with geometric optimality constraints for uh, optimal impulsive control, to be able to identify optimal maneuver locations, uh, to reduce the number of candidate optimal maneuver times, uh, and come up with a rapid computation of what a reconfiguration minimum cost is. Michelle Chernick extended this into a closed form methodology, a uh, deterministic approach by actually identifying the dominance cases, which we'll go over in a bit, that dictate reconfiguration minimum costs and coming up with an analytical solution for these dominance cases, given that reachable sets in ROE space are relatively simple. Uh, using this approach, was then able to create provably optimal four maneuver um, impulsive schemes that were able to completely control six degree of freedom ROE space. So for the optimal uh, like mathematical basis, um, like most other people here, I'm using quasi non single relative orbital elements, so I won't get too deep into that. Uh, the differential drag force model is still unchanged where we have the very typically used in the literature formulation for the acceleration <laughs> on a single spacecraft with differential drag. And this, well, for atmospheric drag, it becomes differential drag when it becomes a difference between cheap and deadly spacecraft as to how much drag is interacting with one as opposed to another. Uh, for simplicity, this uh, formulation here assumes near circular orbit, so the velocity in the um, drag acceleration is just B equals NA, circular orbit. And then also we're assuming that the RTN frame of the deputy is aligned with chief, such that control force for differential drag simplifies down to a force that's only in the tangential direction and strictly dependent on this Augmented differential ballistic coefficient, which at its heart is really just a varying of a differential cross-sectional area in between the two spacecraft. So in its most general formulation, the problem is to minimize a cost C, which is the function of all the actions in the control window. This is subject to a quantity known as the pseudo state, which is the difference between the, the final desired state and the initial state propagated across the control window by an SDO. Uh, this is set equal to all 
control actions in the control window also propagate it to the end of the control window uh, by the SDM and the control matrix. Propulsive control can be separated from differential drag control by assuming that propulsive maneuvers act impulsively, which means they're an instantaneous addition of delta V when they occur. So doing this, we can kind of break these two terms apart, where we have the propulsive control, which is a discretized set of maneuvers. Uh, in the case of Swarm X, it's an L2 norm cost function because it has a single thruster that can point in any orientation. And for the dynamics constraint, that means that we have an LTV formulation of a linear time variant formulation of propulsive control, given that we have this impulsive assumption. For differential drag, we can also reach an LTV formulation by holding certain uh, variables constant, specifically the differential ballistic coefficient and the atmospheric density. Uh, over each time step that we're considering that atmospheric or differential drag occurs, you can then break up your desired control window into an arbitrary number of discretized time steps and integrate differential drag's effect over each time step. The sum of these time steps is the full effective differential drag on the final state over the control window in an LTV formulation that then we can analyze with reachable set theory. So now we have an entire reachable set theory compatible problem here. Uh, and the nice part about this is that differential drag is a zero delta V cost maneuver, so it's just removed from the cost function, which is where we get the cost savings from. So for reachable set theory, just in general, as a kind of review, it's a geometric framework for optimal control problems with normalized cost functions, LTV dynamics is what we have. Uh, it analyzes the set of pseudo states that can be reached by any single action of a single constant cost within the control window. So any action, any time, any orientation in RTN. Uh, the convex hull of all of these maneuvered samples is a set of pseudo states that can be reached by a uh, set of multiple maneuvers of combined equal cost to the single maneuver. And this leads to the idea of dominance cases where different regions of the reachable set dictate the uh, minimum cost that a, a full reconfiguration can be reached in. This uh, region is usually dictated by a specific dimension of the ROE pseudo state. So they're named as such. We have the delta A dominance case, the delta lambda dominance case, which we'll show in a second. Um, and so we can define these dominance cases, determine optimal cost for full reconfiguration, and then find an optimal solution strategy, or at least quantify how suboptimal we are. So what I have here are the reachable sets for ROE space. It says near circular orbit up there. Uh, so this is assuming near. Oh, I didn't even know I could do that. Cool. Uh, so this is assuming near circular orbit for a 10 orbit control window and a 100 orbit control window. And you can see, as I was mentioning before, that these are fairly uh, simple shapes here, where delta A, delta lambda is a parallelogram. And then we, for the 10-orbit control window, and we have circles for the delta E dominance case and delta I dominance case. And these, this set of reachable sets here on the top are the same reachable sets that Michelle found in her work. Um, as we expand out the control window to say like a 100-orbit control window, we can see that the delta A, delta lambda, and delta E planes remain relatively the same, they're the exact same shape. Uh, but delta I is not. Delta I is a lemon. A really annoying lemon. <laughs> and so this is what kind of clued me into there's not a, there's more going on here and it's not quite as simple as just using the old methodology. Uh, I'll get to exactly what this is in a second, but that gives you an idea of as the control window gets extended, different things get changed. So to come up with closed form solutions for impulsive control, the first observation to make is in the control matrix itself, control is decoupled between in-plane and out-of-plane states, meaning that in-plane maneuvers, radial and tangential maneuvers, only affect the in-plane ROE, delta A, delta lambda, relative eccentricity vector, whereas normal maneuvers only affect the relative inclination vector. So we can break the optimal impulsive control problem into two mutually optimal decoupled in-plane and out-of-plane problems, where in the in-plane case, you find the in-plane dominance case, find optimal maneuver locations, 
uh, find the effect of a maneuver at these locations, and then find a three maneuver combination that can op hopefully optimally solve the problem. And I'll go over this more in detail. Uh, for out of plane, because there are fewer dimensions of ROE that are attempting to be controlled, it's a much simpler process. There are a lot fewer optimal maneuver times. You basically just find them and solve the problem. So first, establishing dominance cases for the implant states. So um, you can see that these dominance cases are kind of, as I was mentioning before, affected by regions of the convex hull. So for the delta A dominance case, the top and bottom of that parallelogram there, and the optimal maneuver location to conduct the delta A dominant maneuver is any time in the control window. And you can kind of understand this by looking at all these maneuver samples here and how they align with this entire bound here. So really any time, as long as you're acting in the desired direction of the delta A pseudostate is optimal. For delta lambda, the only two optimal maneuver locations are the beginning and the end of the control window, which you can again see by where the samples meet the reachable set. Um, in the optimal direction at the beginning of the control window is this in the same sign as the delta lambda pseudo state. At the end, it's the opposite sign. For the delta E dominance case, because we have a, it's controlled primarily by periodic functions, optimal maneuver locations actually occur about twice per orbit. And they alternate in the tangential direction, which direction acts directly towards uh, the desired uh, delta E pseudo state. And this is what we primarily take advantage of when coming up with a maneuver plan. So if we restrict the number of maneuvers we consider to only the delta E dominant maneuver times, we can effectively reduce this four dimensional problem to three dimensions, delta A, delta lambda, and then directly towards or away from the desired delta E pseudo state. That means that we've now, for every single one of these optimal maneuvers that we're considering, uh, reduce ourselves down to a three-dimensional problem where all three dimensions scale linearly with the uh, desired pseudostate. These should be deltas here. I don't know why these ones can show up. So then we have all of our optimal maneuver locations. We can find the effect of a, a maneuver at a given time by taking the delta B minimum of the reconfiguration and propagating it into pseudostate space then solve a system of equations to be able to find, um, I'll also did one better. Um, solve system equations to find essentially coefficients of maneuver magnitude and solve for a set of maneuvers. So uh, for example, for a delta E dominant plan, you solve a system of equations here where you have an optimality constraint and then the non-dominant ROEs just meeting their final desired state. Same for delta A dominant, you have optimality constraint, the non-dominant ROEs. And then in a worst case scenario, if there is no optimal maneuver plan, you can also solve the problem suboptimally by just meeting final uh, state requirements. So this takes finding optimal control and basically turns it into a simple three by three matrix inversion uh, system of linear equations problem. So the example of how this works. So if we have the pseudo state at the top there and a reconfiguration of 30 orbits, first we're, we determine the in-plane dominance case with those analytical equations that Michelle derived. You can see here the largest dominance case is delta E here. So it's a delta E dominant problem. We can then find a set of optimal maneuver locations. The, the phase that we're looking for for the relative eccentricity vector is about one radian. And then you find the series of optimal maneuver times, which correspond to this one radian location as a bunch of times throughout the control window. You can find the effect of a maneuver at each one of these locations. So multiplying the delta V minimum, propagating it to pseudo state space. And then you iterate through all combinations of the three maneuvers possible. And see what maneuver scheme they'll come up with. Theoretically, these are all viable maneuver schemes. We're looking for the lowest cost. So we have the delta E dominant plan over there. Uh, if it doesn't, can't come up with an optimal maneuver plan, we revert to the suboptimal plan. Um, and then we kind of just retain this knowledge as we go and output the plan with the lowest cost that we find. In this case, you can kind of see an example here where you have the coefficients uh, um, in relation to the minimum cost of the reconfiguration. In this case, this is the optimal 
uh, set. So the sum of them equals one. So meet the optimality constraint. And then you output your maneuver times and your maneuver magnitudes, uh, taking this from coefficients back up to meters per second. So everything that I've shown so far uh, had already been done. This was Michelle's strategy for solving your circular optimal control. Um, so now we get to new stuff. So first things first, gosh, this did not work, did it? Oh, well. Um, efficiently finding a maneuver plan. So if you notice the naive approach before, uh, the approach was to search all possible maneuver plans, all combinations of three maneuver sets. But this becomes really computationally expensive as the control window expands because it's essentially an n choose three problem. It requires that many iterations to solve. And it's impossible to run like even on MATLAB. So to reduce this number of uh, optimal combinations, we want to find maneuvers that are guaranteed to be, to be in a lowest cost maneuver plan. To do this, we want to find the maneuvers that most efficiently and best span the non-dominant dimension pseudostate space. Uh, really, this comes down to a one-dimensional problem because the delta A and delta E effects, given our restricted number of maneuver times, are the same no matter where they are. So it's just really a pseudostate delta lambda problem uh, because it's time dependent. So for delta E dominant optimal reconfigurations, uh, you can see the effect <coughs> as you go through the control window on that pseudo state, the relative effect of maneuvers oscillates because we have tangential maneuvers going in either direction. So the most efficient, best, best spanning maneuvers are actually the first two maneuvers there because they have the highest relative effect on the pseudo state. And they also best span in both directions, the delta lambda um, state. For delta A dominant reconfigurations, it's the first and last optimal maneuver locations because we're only having tangential maneuvers that act in a single direction. So again, we have the first maneuver that has the highest relative effect. And then we have the maneuver that acts in the most different direction, which is the last maneuver because it's basically a zero effect. Uh, and it's worth noting that when you're looking at these, like all these man maneuver combinations, depending on the reconfiguration, you can have multiple optimal combinations of maneuver times. So what we're really trying to find here is not necessarily, we're trying to find one that's guaranteed to be optimal. Uh, if you solve all the maneuver combinations, you could come up with a different plan than what this methodology will necessarily come up with, but this is guaranteed to have the lowest possible cost the RUE that you are given within the closed form architecture. And the effect on this is actually pretty substantial. So uh, over there on the left, I have the number of iterations required to solve for impulsive control. And on the bottom is the number of orbits in the control window. Uh, and you can see that like it's in n choose three problems, so it scales quadratically. Uh, whereas the new methodology scales linearly given that all we are really doing is we've identified two optimal maneuver locations and iterating through the rest of them. Uh, it's difficult to see, so I actually restricted the plot here and then listed some larger control windows on the right there. For a 50-orbit control window, trying to go through all the iterations is over uh, 100,000 iterations, whereas the new methodology, it's still under 100. And if you go out to like a full 400 orbit control window, MATLAB can't even tell me how many iterations that would require to solve for control. With a new methodology, we're still under 1,000. So we've now taken this architecture and we've made it actually feasible to implement for an arbitrary control length, length on the SwarmX. So something you may notice I didn't mention before, the delta lambda dominant reconfigurations. Delta lambda dominant reconfigurations don't play nicely with the closed form architecture because there's an inherent disagreement with optimal maneuver times. Delta lambda dominant reconfigurations, optimal times want to be the beginning and the end of the control window. And this is rarely going to align with the desired phase of the relative eccentricity vector. So it doesn't really fit in. The old approach was to just use the lowest cost to, to iterate through all solutions and use the lowest cost maneuver plan. Um, but we can do better. 
by actually applying delta lambda dominant maneuvers until there actually is a disagreement in the remaining reconfiguration between optimal maneuver times. And this disagreement occurs when the effect of a maneuver on the reconfiguration causes the remaining delta V D minima between two different re, uh, two different dominance cases to be equal. So if we start with a delta lambda dominant reconfiguration and we start applying maneuver at the beginning of the control window, eventually we will reach a point where the delta V minima for delta lambda equals either delta A or delta E. If it's delta A, then we just move to the other end of the control window and continue adding because there is no disagreement. Delta A can occur at any time in the control window. Uh, and we keep doing either that first or second maneuver until the delta V minimums with between delta lambda and delta E are the same, at which point we now have a mutually delta lambda dominant and delta E dominant problem, and there is no further solution beyond the closed form architecture in its current state to be able to solve it. But theoretically, from that point, we can solve a delta E uh, optimal dominant problem. So you can see that here where the triplets of maneuvers have now been added. And for an example, what this looks like, uh, again, for reconfiguration, 30 orbits, this is a different pseudo state. Um, determine the in plane dominance case, the top delta lambda dominant reconfiguration. You then apply the beginning of the maneuver, the beginning of the control window. And this is basically saying here that delta V minima are analytical equations that are a function of the desired pseudo state which means that we can also formulate these equations as the function of the desired pseudo state minus a control action's effect uh, at a certain time and the pseudo state that's produced. So we find at uh, the beginning and the end of the control window, the relative effects of a maneuver. Um, and we see where the delta V minimums equal each other. So in this case, we have delta lambda equaling delta A first, uh, we move to the other end of the control window. We add a maneuver there until it equals uh, the delta E, delta V minimum. And then we proceed with the rest of the normal closed form methodology. Uh, and this gets us pretty close to optimal. Uh, I think as close as we're going to get. Uh, you see with the old method, we have actual just total uh, solution maneuver cost over there and how much percentage that is actually suboptimal over here for that uh, given reconfiguration and an extending control window. And you can see that kind of interestingly, the main advantage that this like approach has is actually in the shorter control windows. Uh, that's when it has the biggest advantage over the old method. And this advantage kind of um, lessens as the control window expands more and more, which can be thought of as as the control window gets larger and larger, the distinction between the very beginning of the control window and just sometime near the beginning of the control window becomes basically zero. So that's that effect that you see there. Uh, but on the, so for the really long control windows, it doesn't give us a huge amount of advantage, but especially down here for like the single number of orbits control window, there's a significant advantage to using this. Lemon. <laughs> so, what is the lemon? Um, I have the reachable sets listed up there again. The lemon is actually a product of coupling between in plane and out of plane states that's occurring because of the length of the control window. We made this decoupling assumption before because of the way the control matrix is. To get the pseudo state, we've also got to multiply it by the STM. And the coupling terms here. Um, uh, there's not a coupling term. A coupling term 6, 1, and 2, 5 effectively mean that in-plane maneuvers affect components of the out-of-plane state. Out-of-plane maneuvers affect components of the in-plane state. And that's what's showing up there. You can see that on this visualization here, where we have the same reachable set, but then in blue, we only have normal maneuvers and those samples listed. So we can actually see the tangential effect directly right there. Uh, so it has a substantial in-plane component in the extended control windows. And the way to deal with this is to observe that in-plane maneuvers are only, uh, the only optimal direction for in-plane maneuvers is the tangential direction. And in fact, we know what effect that tangential, those tangential maneuvers are going to have on the final state 
because we have a prescribed delta y the dominant desire. And we know that this quantity here is going to be equal to the tangential maneuvers in the controller. Guaranteed. Uh, so then we can take this effect and we can add it to the component of the out-of-plane pseudo-state that's affected by it and come up with a simple expression down here which takes the known effects but the in-plane solution propagates the out-of-plane. Uh, as far as accommodating the out-of-plane effect on the in-plane pseudo-state, that can be solved by just simply solving out-of-plane control first, subtracting the effect of those maneuvers away, and then solving for the in-plane reconfiguration. So now that we've removed that tangential effect, we look at just the normal effect of maneuvers because again, it's still not a circle. It's still not the old approach. Uh, and I've kind of defined four regions here, four different areas of the reachable set that define uh, optimal costs and optimal maneuver locations over the control window. It's a more um, complex shape than most of the early reachable sets. So I don't have an easy analytical solution to show for each one of the delta V minima up here. But the main takeaway here is all of them are either linear combinations of maneuvers in the first and last orbit of the control window, or it's a single maneuver in the first or last orbit of the control window. And down here, I validate this by looking at all four regions uh, using Adam's numerical algorithm to find delta V minima for just out of plane reconfigurations and the approach here where I'm looking at very small amounts of error. Um, I think using the same justification that Michelle used, I think these are actually optimal because it's without the tolerance of Adam Solver. Uh, and over here, so this is actually the generic equation for what a delta V minimum is. To come up with the analytical solutions, we know what this outward normal vector is far more simplistically for the in-plane states. This is more complicated, so I don't have that. Uh, but that's the base equation that I'm using. So for out-of-plane reconfigurations, uh, the general approach, you account for in-plane maneuvering with the equation I showed before. You determine the out-of-plane region. In this case, it's region three. Uh, region three is a set of optimal maneuver locations at a uh, out-of-plane phase of zero. So you find those two locations. You again find the relative effects of those maneuvers, you solve a linear system of equations, get maneuvers, maneuver plan, and propagate this effect to the in plane uh, pseudo state, solve for in plane maneuver. So, for the validation, I have a delta lambda dominant reconfiguration here with initial orbital elements of swarm X. Propagation parameters up there on the right, 30 by 30 uh, gravity model, NRLM size, satellite parameters from SwarmX. Uh, initial and final states of the ROE over 50 orbit control window. For the different control methods, we can see that uh, I'm coming up with a lower in plane cost for delta lambda dominance cases we expect. Uh, I'm coming up with a lower, more accurate delta V minimum for out of plane. Um, but the out-of-plane cost is higher. We'll see why in a second. And finally, the runtime. So even for a 50 orbit, just a 50 orbit control window uh, on 16 gigs of RAM engineering laptop hardware, this is taking five seconds to run. And this is running almost instantaneously. So that just demonstrates how big of an effect is going on here on just what will be like a fairly normal control window size. So here we can see the maneuver plans for tangential and normal maneuvering by the old algorithm, my algorithm. The final state error is listed here, and the delta A, delta lambda plane, and delta I plane shown here. Um, and you can see the effect of some of the modifications I've made comparing these two algorithms. For example, we have a triplet of maneuvers here, whereas here we have a maneuver at the beginning, and then a triplet of maneuvers. This optimal location for out of plane maneuvering is here, whereas mine finds it in the first orbit. Actually, that's subject to the full force model. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can see they find relatively similar um, uh, in plane maneuvering uh, trajectories. 
that out of plane, the reason why the cost is so much higher is because we're actually accounting for the effects of the in-plane maneuver now. So we have this delta IY component that is solved for, and so we actually end up at the desired state instead of somewhere in the And the effect of this maneuvering is propagated back onto this, which is why the delta my error is a little bit longer. Um, so I think I'll just breeze through this even more briefly than I was going to, because this is mostly the same stuff that I was showing in Charlotte. Again, uh, reachable sets for differential drag, um, zero cost maneuver, bang, bang control, reachable sets are formed by, con by a maneuver length as opposed to maneuver magnitude. Uh, and you find the hybrid reachable set by combining all combinations of the impulsive maneuvers with all the possible drag maneuver lengths. You come up with these hybrid reachable sets down here, which leads to the formation of these um, different drag profiles, which I validated against numerical simulations for all three of the implant dominance cases, and also came up with a drag only maneuver plan, which optimally combines aspects of all three dominance cases together. The real addition here is to start to account for uncertainty. So we have various sources of uncertainty acting on the LTP formulation. Uh, as far as linear sources, we have maneuver magnitude from inaccuracies in the atmospheric density model, uh, inaccuracies from initial relative state from navigation. Non-linearly, we have inaccuracies in maneuver timing, uh, comparing the instantaneous, uh, the assumption we've made of instantaneous attitude adjustments versus actual dynamics and um, initial absolute state from navigation. And with each one, we have an expected variance uh, that we'll see in flight and then propagate it out to, okay, what is the final state error that's going to be caused by that variance? You can see here that by far the greatest effect is from errors in the atmospheric density model, which is kind of confirming what we already suspected. So that's where we're gonna have to pay the most attention. As far as modeling goes so far, uh, some of the things that I've done using the same average density for the chief and the deputy, since the difference between the two over a long control window is negligible. Um, observing that modeling error translates directly to additional costs and successive resolves. And then looking into trying to use the upper and lower confidence bound. So if you use a lower confidence bound for atmospheric density, there's a lower expected drag effect, meaning there's more impulsive maneuvering and there's oscillating overshoot. Whereas we use the upper confidence bound, there's higher drag, lower impulsive maneuvering, we kind of approach that desired state more incrementally. Uh, and looking at how those confidence bounds affect things. So as far as what's next, that's the big thing of what's next, is actually coming up with a robust control strategy for hybrid control within an MPC setup uh, that preserves the hybrid cost savings while not letting the final state error deteriorate completely. Uh, Another thing I'm looking at is a uh, couple tangential normal maneuver methodology. So as we saw for the extremely long control windows, the advantage of having delta lambda dominant maneuvers at the very beginning and end goes away. So can we combine delta lambda dominant maneuvers with delta I dominant maneuvers and come up with some L2 norm cost savings for a reconfiguration, both in plan and out of plan? And then flight code. So we're currently at minimum viable product with the stuff that I derived in Charlotte and with the old algorithms. We're taking all these advancements and actually applying them in uh, C++. And that's all I got.